new Sunday morning life groups are beginning. In room 207, Darlena Reynolds will be leading a group based on the book One at a Time by Kyle Eidelman. Participants will study how Jesus changed the world by loving people one at a time and will learn how God wants to use us to influence our world. In room 204, Tara McCown will lead a small group study on the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Because it comes first, Genesis provides a foundation for the rest of Scripture. Participants will study themes of creation, relationship, covenant, hope, and redemption. Check your bulletin for a complete schedule of these and all the other great life groups we have for adults, teens, and kids. All men aged 18 and up are invited to come play basketball on Monday evenings from 7 to 9 in the church gym. Men, don't miss this chance to be active and to make new connections with other guys. If you have questions, contact the church office. The Big Serve is an opportunity for churches from across the nation to join together and serve their communities. Projects will vary from church to church and will include serving our community with free hot dogs and assembling crisis care kits. These are great opportunities for people of all ages to serve together. Mark your calendars for Saturday, April 27th and watch for more details coming soon. We provide Sunday morning life groups are beginning. In room 207, Darlena Reynolds will be leading a group based on the book One at a Time by Kyle Eidelman. Participants will study how Jesus changed the world by loving people one at a time and will learn how God wants to use us to influence our world. In room 204, Tara McCown will lead a small group study on the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Because it comes first, Genesis provides a foundation for the rest of Scripture. Participants will study themes of creation, relationship, covenant, hope, and redemption. Check your bulletin for a complete schedule of these and all the other great life groups we have for adults, teens, and kids. All men aged 18 and up are invited to come play basketball on Monday evenings from 7 to 9 in the church gym. Men, don't miss this chance to be active and to make new connections with other guys. If you have questions, contact the church office. The Big Serve is an opportunity for churches from across the nation to join together and serve their communities. Projects will vary from church to church and will include serving our community with free hot dogs and assembling crisis care kits. These are great opportunities for people of all ages to serve together. Mark your calendars for Saturday, April 27th and watch for more details coming soon. We provide a couple of ways for you to give tithes and offerings here at South Charleston First. You can place offerings in the baskets that will be passed during the service or drop them in the wooden boxes you can find in the cafe and foyer. Or you can give online by visiting scnaz.com slash give. Please check to make sure your cell phone is silenced. If you are new to us, please fill out one of the welcome cards you'll find in the seat pocket in front of you. After service, take your completed card to connections in the back of the sanctuary. We'd love to meet you in person and we have a small gift for first time visitors. That's it for announcements. Now, let's worship together. People here, I love it. It's awesome. Let's stand. Let's all stand as we worship and turn to maybe two and a half people and tell them, hallelujah. Good to see you here today. Turn the person behind you and say hello. Ha <laughs> ha. I gotcha. April Fools. Yeah, that's what happened. All right. Now turn the person beside you and say, you ready? I'm just killing time right here because we're a little early, so <laughs> I'm being awkward. Uh, hallelujah, but God is good. And all the time... All right, let's hit it. Let's 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 do it. Yeah.
place to be in the house of the Lord with fellow believers. I do want to encourage you today that we are a house of prayer, and we want to pray for you. If you have a need, you can utilize, you know, you can send it on the email. But I also want to encourage you, if you have a need, please, please, you don't ever hesitate to reach out to one of the staff members. You can text, you can call your life group leaders. We want to know about these things in your life, and we count it as a privilege to pray for you. And we have a prayer team, too, that's always on call, always ready to pray in these situations. And I'm reminded of that today as I was reading uh, the verse of the day with the YouVersion app. You need to download that on your phone. If you have a smartphone, that's awesome. I use it daily. But it's Ephesians 6, verse 18. It says, never stop praying. Then it goes on to say, especially for others. Always pray by the power of the Spirit. Stay alert and keep praying for God's people. And that's what we want to do at South Charleston First. We want to be a people of prayer. We count it a privilege 
to lift you up and encourage you in your time of need. Let's have our ushers come forward as we receive the morning tithes and offerings. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for all you've done and yet to do. We thank you for the truth of that song, that this is who you are, Lord. You love us, you save us, and you bore the cross and you beat that grave. Hallelujah. And so let all of heaven and earth proclaim. Let everything that has breath, and that's us, Lord. If we have breath in our lungs, we should praise you, Lord. And to say, this is our God, King Jesus. And we thank you for pulling us out of that grave. We thank you, Lord, for all you've done. And so today we enter into you, Lord. We enter into your presence, knowing that you are for us and with us always. And so whatever our need, God, we lay it at your feet today, knowing that you are more than able. And you, your grace is sufficient for us. And so be praised, be glorified, be lifted up in Jesus' name. Amen. So we receive the morning tithes and offerings. Check out this video today. We were not created to live stagnant lives to be stuck, bound, or broken. We were created with a purpose, a calling, a mandate, a mission. Even in these uncertain times, that calling remains the same, to go into the world, to make disciples, to share the love, of Jesus. This is the work of Easter, the greatness of God, the power of the resurrection in action. What Jesus did has changed us, made us a new creation, given us an unimaginable hope. Grace has taken root. Mercy has flooded our souls and the promise of eternity has redefined our everything. So why keep all that to ourselves? It's time to put Easter in motion, to make a difference, to share Jesus with the world around us. If your life has been changed, it's time to get to work. Amen. Thank you for uh, being here with us today. We're thrilled that you're a part of our service this morning. And uh, if you look around, there are a few younger ones with us today that aren't typically here. They're typically back in uh, children's church. Uh, but we're doing the, this, uh, inviting them to come maybe quarterly, something like that. We haven't really set it on the calendar exactly yet, but we're thrilled that our kids are in worship with us today. I had the privilege of listening to a couple of them sing right behind me and beside me today. It's always good to have them in worship with us and joining us uh, and giving praise to the Lord. And of course, uh, this is also a baptismal service, and so we're looking forward to uh, all of this service uh, entails for us today. We are beginning a new series of sermons uh, this week, and we're going to be focusing in on what the denominational church of the Nazarene is focusing in on, um, and, and we're excited about that. And really, we're honing our focus on what the church should be, what the church should always be about. And one of the things that the church needs to be about is blessing our community. Um, and so that's the focus for the entirety of this series, this 50 days that goes from Easter until Pentecost. And there's actually a devotional book, a prayer journal, uh, that we would like it to make available to you. Uh, there were some back in the first cafe. There might be some still back there at the Welcome Center. I'm not really sure. Uh, but we'll get our hands on those. And if you did not receive one of these devotional books and would like to receive one, we invite you to receive one today. And that way we can always kind of be on the same page as we go through this series together. We'll have a couple of weeks where we'll di divert a little bit from the schedule. Uh, we've got Faith Promise Sunday schedule. We've got a uh, youth service uh, coming up. Is that just next Sunday, by the way? Yeah, I think it's next Sunday, so we're excited about that. So these are not outside the bounds of blessing our community, but the focus maybe won't be along with the uh, prayer journal on that particular week. But 
typically for this, uh, for this period of time, we're going to be focusing in that way. And so we're inviting you to listen to the sermon that I've prepared uh, for today that's going to be at least in part about this larger idea of blessing our community, the church alive going forth to bless our community. Here we are. Uh, some of you were here with us last week, and a great number of you returned this week, and we're thrilled about that. We celebrated Easter, of course, last week. It is the Sunday after Easter. That's how many of us refer to this Sunday, right? Uh, many times, in fact, I'm not even here preaching on this particular Sunday. It's a great Sunday for a pastor to take off after the big celebratory Easter Sunday. You know, you kind of leave the remnants to the associate pastors, and they kind of pick up the scraps on the Sunday after Easter. That's the way sometimes it works. Uh, but around us, you know, we've got Easter lilies that are browning now, right? They're, they're dying off. The, the fanciest pastel-colored clothes that many of us put on last week uh, have found their ways back into the closets, though I've, I've got my pretty pastels back out again today, and some of you have joined me in that. There are numerous uh, beheaded chocolate bunnies strewn about everywhere, right, as a result of this being after Easter. Hallelujah, hallelujah anthems have been softened by the more serene hymns. A celebration has been replaced by the common. That's what goes on in the church many times, the Sunday after Easter. But it doesn't have to be that way, and it shouldn't be that way. The fact of the matter is, this is not the Sunday after Easter properly said, but it really is the second Sunday of Easter. Now, some could argue that that's just a very small difference, but I disagree. disagree. It really is an important distinction, for it determines if we see Easter as an event past, something to be remembered, or is Easter rather a present, living, continuing reality, something to be relived in us and reenacted by us. I contend that that's the case. It is, in fact, the second Sunday of Easter. Easter. Would you say that with me? The second Sunday of Easter. You see, this was the situation that was facing the earliest witnesses of the resurrection, those first disciples. Following Easter, following the resurrection, would they simply return to their life as usual, or would Easter really change everything? We're going to read that story from John's Gospel, chapter 20. We're going to begin at verse 19. I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's Word. We're taking, we're taking off right from the verse we left off from last week. At verse 19, I'm going to re be reading through verse 31. That Sunday evening, so the Sunday of Easter, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him... We have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, and suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. You may be seated. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word today. It's a very personal question as it was last week. What difference does Easter make? If you look at the lives of the disciples early on in this story, well, you might come away saying, well, not very much, right? I mean, last week we celebrated Jesus' bursting forth from the grave, conquering death, giving life. 
And today, we get to see his followers' reaction to all of that. But to find them, how do we, where do we have to find them? We've got to peer through a window into a darkened room at the disciples huddled in fear behind locked doors. Why? Because they were scared to death. Make no mistake about it. The fear that had overwhelmed them and was overtaking them was the fear of, or, or the emotion of fear that it had overtaken them. Verse 19 tells us that the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Fear. What are you afraid of? I mean, fear is a debilitating uh, emotion at times. It can, it can restrict us, constrict us, freeze us in place, paralyze us. What, ex- what fear are you experiencing even now? For some people, it's flying. For other people, it might be swimming. Uh, Pastor Kyle is, is scared to death of ostriches and clowns. <laughs> Explain that. I really can't. All of us have our different unique fears, right? Some people might be fearful of eating chicken livers or putting mayonnaise on a sandwich. I mean, that's fear for some people. I've got this terrible fear of, of heights. That's one of my great fears. We drove up to Pikes Peak as a family on, on uh, sabbatical when I had some weeks off, and we went out west, drove up to the top of Pikes Peak, and I got up there to the parking lot. We went into the little store that was located on the top of that mountain. I looked over the edge, and I said, it's time to get out of here. And so I packed the family up, and back down the hill we went after being there for about 10 minutes. And that's not an exaggeration. I thought, i got to get back down on more flat surfaces. That's just where I had to be. I've got other fears as well. I'm fearful of the wind. Not like any wind we experienced here this week. I mean, I wasn't fearful then, but when I went to over, we dated date Kelly over at Mount Vernon College, and we've been dating not that very long. We went over to Mount Vernon to a little park over there. We were going to have a little picnic and that kind of thing. We'd eaten our sandwich. We'd kind of laid back on the blanket just looking up at the sky and looking up into the trees, and those trees started blowing. It was a beautiful day outside, but those, the wind started moving those trees, and I suddenly was overtaken by this fear that that wind was going to be enough to knock down these huge trees all around me, and it was a bright day outside. I mean, I'm only making the point that sometimes our fears are real, and sometimes our fears are very much imagined, right? There's a story that proves the point. It was a story about an elderly lady out in Fort Smith, Arkansas. I don't know why it has to be about an old lady all the time, but so many times it is. It was about an old lady out in Fort Smith, Arkansas, you define elderly for yourself, right? She was in a, parking, in, a, in, a, in a parking lot seated in her car. She was on the bad side of town, so maybe she already had some fear kind of brewing in her mind. But suddenly there was this loud bang, and she felt this sharp, painful uh, hit into the back of her head. She was holding her hands behind her head when a passerby went by, a, a man, and asked her, are you doing okay? And the woman said this, I've been shot in the head and I'm trying to hold my brains in. That's pretty bad. That's pretty bad. As it turns out, it, she wasn't in that bad of shape. The loud explosion had been a Pillsbury biscuit canister that had exploded in her back seat, apparently from the heat. Her brains, well, that was just the gooey dough that was shot into the back of the woman's head. A significant overreaction to what she feared, right? Fear. The disciples, though, listen, in this story, the disciples had every reason to be afraid. They were there when the sword-wielding soldiers uh, 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 drug Jesus from the, from the garden. Peter wit- witnessed his questioning, the false charges, the libelous accusations. They saw the hatred in the eyes of the crowd as they shouted for Jesus to be crucified. They watched in horror as that crown of thorns was placed on Jesus' head and his back was scourged by that whip. They were there when Jesus was crucified on the tree, and they well knew that that same fate might await them. They were fearful. And so you won't hear me say that, that I would have been any different than maybe some of them at this point in the game. I think I would have been right there with them, hiding and isolating and cowering in fear after Easter. But the good news is that Jesus showed up. Jesus came, reminding, reminding them that these are the days not after Easter, but these are the days of Easter. And he spoke the promise into their ears. And what was the promise? It was the promise of his peace. Did you hear those words that Jesus greeted them with? Peace be with you. 
No doubt those were the same words that those other gatherers had shared with each other. That was a customary, common greeting. Everybody said it. They said it to each other as they came into that meeting place. But how much more would those words have meant being spoken by the storm-calming, water-walking, death-defeating, life-giving Son of God, Jesus Christ Himself? How much more do those words, peace be with you, mean when they're spoken by Jesus Christ? Jesus walked into their presence, and He, as He did that, He was leading them into a new reality. He was not going to leave them where they were, locked in, bottled up. No, as is always the case, when we are fearful, Jesus comes seeking, Jesus comes looking. I might even say knocking at this point, but in this story, Jesus didn't knock at all, right? He just appeared in the room. And when he did, he did. He wanted to avail them to his grace. He wanted to speak his grace to them. He wanted to pour his grace over them and give them confidence and change their lives. And I want you to recognize that this morning, that Jesus has come to make their life different. He has come to make your life different. They had these disciples early on in this process, they had rejected the words of Mary, right? Do you remember her words from last week that I have seen the Lord and yet they were still bottled up and fearful. They had left the empty tomb only to enter new tombs of their own fear and their doubt and their blindness. They made a trade of sorts. They had simply left locations though. They had moved from a tomb into a house and they had traded a stone that had been rolled away from that empty tomb and replaced it with locked doors. So John is telling us this story as a reality. This is what literally is going on. This is the disciples hiding and cowering in fear. But it also has deeper meaning. This is also a story that is analogous. It, it, it is, it is sp speaking to the interior condition of their heart. This is not just their physical location. This is what's going on in their life. They are still entombed. They're still, they're still very much in grave clothes, wrapped up. They're behind the stones of past failures and future fears. And I'm asking you another question this morning. Do you have any locked up places in your life like that? Are you still condemning yourself because of something that's happened in your past? Have you lost a loved one? And in your grieving, do you continue to live as if death has the last word? Are you willing to accept the love offered by others? Or do you continue to find a way to sabotage every relationship? Are your fears about the future controlling you? Could I say something to you that Jesus is in fact here and he's here right now? And he has words to say to you, my peace I offer you. Some of you are in those locked up places, and some of those have to do with your past. Some of those locked up places have to do with your future. I found this quote in the Anglican Digest that helped me think about what Jesus' presence means to me in this moment. It, it reads this way, I was regretting the past and fearful of the future. Suddenly, God was speaking to me, and what he said to me was this, My name is I Am. I waited, and God continued. When you live in the past with its mistakes and regrets, it is so very hard. I am not there, God says. My name is not I Was. When you live in the future with its problems and fears, it is also hard. But I am not there. My, na my name is not I Will Be. Here's the key. When you live in the moment, it is not hard. I am here because my name is I am. And so Jesus says that I want to enter all those locked up places, wherever that might be, and I want to speak my peace to you, my persistent, present, perpetual peace for every moment. I will give you one more reminder. All those locked up places in our lives, they might have a multitude of different names. But all of those locked up places are locked from the inside. Jesus will not knock down the doors, but Jesus will do this. Jesus will give you every opportunity to open the door to new life in him, that you might be a new creation, that you might be to an, introduced to a new way of living in him if you will simply unlock that door and allow Jesus into your life. And so the emotion is fear. 
Jesus' promise is peace, and it comes with this encouragement. What is the encouragement for all of us? To believe, to believe upon him. In this story, Jesus visits the the disciples a couple of times. Uh, The first time, if you remember the story, Thomas is not there. He's AWOL. We don't know where he's at. The Bible doesn't tell us, but he's missing. But on the second visit, Thomas is there, and Jesus comes, and Jesus gives him this invitation. He says, put your finger here into my side, and look look at my hands, and put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer, but believe. Uh, As I told the first crowd this morning, I I, I go back to the story of, of, of around the tomb. And if you remember, if you were here last week, you know, we were introduced to different visitors to the tomb. It included Peter and John and Mary. Mary had been the first one there. Then she goes and gets Peter and John. They come back. John came to that point of belief. If you remember, Peter was still questioning what was going on. And Mary herself was still filled with questions, right? She had been there once. She had come the second time. Peter and John leave. And then there's Mary still left there, still wondering really what had happened. And what I love about this story is that Jesus had hung around and, you know, Mary went back into the tomb. She talked to one of the angels there, uh, asked, you know, where, where the body of Christ was. She even thought when the next person showed up at the tomb, who did she think it was but the gardener? And who did it end up being but Jesus Christ himself? And so I love this idea that Jesus stuck around long enough to introduce Mary to himself, bringing her to the point of belief, right? He was patient with her, and that's what we see Jesus doing in this story with Thomas, right? You know, Jesus had said, yes, it, it would be, it, it's great for those who have never seen me, and yet they've believed on me without even seeing me. And when Jesus says that, who's he talking about? Well, we're included in that number, aren't we? That if we're believers in Jesus Christ, we're included in that number. And so Jesus said, So blessed are those who have believed in me without seeing. But still Jesus, when he talks to Thomas, he's not on his case. He's not being negative. He's not driving him down in the dirt. He's not putting his thumb on him and crushing him. That's not what Jesus is doing him. He's encouraging belief. How do we know Thomas in the Bible? Somebody shout it out. As who? Doubting Doubting Thomas. Exactly right. We know him that way, and sometimes he gets a bad rap. Did you notice the nickname that was given Thomas in this passage of scripture it was actually taught the twin right but we know him as doubting thomas but i love how jesus responds to doubting thomas he wasn't harsh to him but rather he was kind he wasn't judgmental he was helpful he wasn't condescending he was understanding and so as we are out there sharing the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ with others, we ought to be so very patient as we're doing that. Sometimes I think we as Christians, we're wanting to close the deal. We're wanting to introduce somebody to Jesus Christ, and what do we want to go? We want to go away with the victory of them accepting Jesus Christ in that very moment. And sometimes that's happened to me very, very, very rarely has that happened to me. Very rarely. Sometimes, if, maybe some people are more gifted than I am in those ways. I'm just encouraging us when people are asking questions, when they're showing curiosity about the things of God, that should intensify our efforts, intensify our, intensify our prayers for them, but it shouldn't cause us just to push, 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 and to give up hope on them and in them if they don't make a decision in that very moment. Jesus didn't do that. He continued to work with people. Don't be so interested in closing the deal. Be most interested in sharing love. How about that? That's what, that's what I think messes up most Christians in their walk with the Lord when it comes to evangelizing. They want to close a deal instead of consistently showing love, showing grace, entering those difficult conversations with people sometimes about the questions and struggles they've got going through life. Sometimes we just want them to accept it all. You know, God's got a reason, some kind of, I'm going to say idiotic statement like that sometimes that comes out of our mouth that we think other people understand. They've got no history with which to even understand that. And yet we try to push them in that direction without being patient. I hope I'm making sense to somebody out there. Somebody just give me a grunt if, if you agree. Okay, I heard a few grunts. I'll take it. So my point is this. If somebody's got questions, if they've got doubts and that leads to questions, and those questions lead to them finding answers, and those answers lead to them accepting Jesus Christ, then I point us back to doubt, and I say doubt has done good work. 
because it drove them on the course. And what does the Bible say? If you seek after me, if you continue to search after me, I will be found. And so that's encouragement to me. So Thomas comes to that place, right? He comes to that place of belief. And I would say, right, that's a place that all of us have to come to. We've got to come to that place of decision. We've got to come to that place of belief. And I want to talk to you about the simplicity of making a decision. Sometimes that's what we need to do. We just need to make a determination, make a decision that we're going to go in this direction, not in another direction of our fears. There's an old show, and I know some of you younger people will not remember it at all. It was called The Bob Newhart Show. It was always on on Saturday nights, and I, I remember watching that as I laid in bed watching my little 13-inch TV that I had back in the day. And I would watch that show, and Bob, Bob was a psychologist, and, uh, and, and so it, it was all about that show. Anyway, there's, there's this uh, scene where this woman is coming to him as a new client. It's her first visit, and Bob was explaining to her how he bills. And he said, this is how I bill. I bill $5 for the first five minutes, and I charge nothing after that. Now, that's a pretty good deal, first and foremost. But Bob assures her that no session with him is going to go over five minutes. It's just not necessary. And so he asked her to start, what, you know, what brought you here? And she explains that she fears being buried alive in a box. He says, would you tell me more? And she says the fear extends to other things like being in tunnels, elevators, houses, cars, anything boxy. And so Bob says, so essentially you're telling me you're claustrophobic. Yes, that's what I'm saying. This exchange takes about two minutes. Bob takes another 10 seconds or so to empathize with her. And so he gave her a lot of empathy in those 10 seconds. How awful it must be to live in this kind of fear. It's horrible, the woman says. All right, Bob says, I'm going to give you two words that I think are going to clear up everything in your life. Just two words. And if you'll integrate them into your life, you should be fine. The woman is very excited. She asks, well, do I need to write these words down? Oh, you can if you like, Bob says, but most people can remember the two words and just go, go forward. She says, okay, leaning forward, are you ready, he asks. And she says, yes, yes, I am. Okay, he says, here are the two words. Bob leans across his desk to put his face close to hers, and he says these two words. Stop it. That's exactly right. Stop it. Now, I'm not reducing all of counseling down to those two words. Stop it. I'm not. There's a place for counseling in your lives. There's, a, there's probably a place for that. But the key is there's got to be also a decision on your part to behaviorally change. There's got to be a determination and a decision made in your life. For Thomas, it was this confession that moved him from fear unto faith, where he chose to believe. And so that's the decision. It is this confession. Thomas made it. He claimed it this way. You are my Lord and my God. What a clear testimony as to who Jesus is to be in our lives. I mean, it's a full embracing of the Christ. It is this confession that allows us to enter in the promised peace of Jesus because it testifies to two distinct but related truths. By confessing Jesus as Lord, I'm expressing my commitment to him. That yes, Jesus, you reign in my life. I've surrendered my being to you. I want you to lead me. I want to walk in your light. I trust you to govern me. You are my Lord. And by confessing Jesus as God, I confirm my ultimate authority and, 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 and belief in his control, that he is in charge, that he is the truth, that his way is the right way, that he is sovereign over all. You are my God. And Thomas makes this confession in full trust and full confidence, knowing, knowing that that statement itself, that you are my Lord and my God, was blasphemous in that culture in which Caesar reigned. And so it was punishable by death to make that sort of confession. But it moved him from doubt unto belief, where he said, God, I'm totally dependent on you. I'm leaning on you entirely. I trust you completely. That's what faith biblically means. And then lastly, it led Thomas to this place, that obedient or that, that faithful confession led him to a place of obedience. That is the command. It was the command to Thomas, and it's the command for us. Jesus told his disciples, what did he say in verse 21? As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. 
Thomas wasn't there when Jesus spoke those words the first time, but it's very clear that he got the message. Tradition and other reliable sources tell us that Thomas became the great evangelizer of India. Many sources claim that he was in India from A.D. 52 until A.D. 72, founding many churches there. It's commonly accepted as well that when a group of non-believers demanded that he deny his faith in Jesus Christ, the one-time doubter exclaimed, I will never, ever renounce Christ. As a result of that confession, because of that refusal, they drove a stake through his body and he died the death of a martyr because he believed and he confessed Jesus Christ. On this second Sunday of Easter, one can understand the hesitation, the hiding, the fear of those first disciples. They had seen what had happened to Jesus. And the fact is, hear me, Jesus refused to promise them a different outcome. He refused to do it. And Jesus, as well, refuses to promise us a different outcome outcome. In fact, to all of those who would follow after him, Jesus said this, since they persecuted me, you might as well expect that they will persecute you. The road to discipleship isn't easy, the cost is high, and I tell you, it is a dangerous road. In his book, Seizing Your Moment, author Erwin McManus tells the following story about his young son. One summer, his son Aaron went to youth camp, children's camp. He was just a little guy. And Erwin talks about the fact that he was glad he was going to church camp. As a result, he says, I figured it wasn't go- he wasn't going to hear anything about ghost stories because ghost stories can, can really cause a kid to have nightmares. But unfortunately, he kind of says it tongue-in-cheek, unfortunately, since it was Christian camp, they didn't tell ghost stories because we don't believe in ghosts. They told demon and Satan stories instead. And so when Aaron came home, he was absolutely terrified. Dad, don't turn off the light, he said before going to bed. No, Daddy, could you stay with me? Daddy, I'm afraid. They told all these stories about the devil and about demons. McManus writes, I wanted to tell him, I wanted to say they're not real. That's what I wanted to do. His son began to plead, Daddy, Daddy, would you pray for me? Would you pray for me that I would be safe? McManus thought, I could feel it. I could feel warm blanket Christianity beginning to wrap around him. A life of safety, safety, safety. But I said, Aaron, I will not pray for you to be safe. I will pray that God would make you dangerous, so dangerous that demons will flee when you enter the room. And Aaron said, all right, Daddy, but I pray that you would pray that I would be really, really, really dangerous. (laughs) I wonder, are we any different in these days of Easter? living as the resurrection people of God, overcoming, not hiding, faithful, not fearful, dangerous, not safe. The emotion may be fear, but he speaks his peace. The encouragement is for us to believe and to confess him as my Lord and my God And his command then is for us to go. Risk takers, risking in love and forgiveness and grace for the cause and for the glory of Jesus Christ. Will we be willing to go and bless our community in the workplace, in the neighborhood, in the home place, wherever we are for the glory of God. Father, this is your word for your people today. We thank you that you are so faithful. We thank you that you are the empowering one, that your grace is sufficient for all the challenges and the struggles and the fears and the temptations and the uncertainties of life. You are the faithful one. And so we we lift our lives to you. 
We want to be resurrected in your power. We want to be made different because we know the risen Lord. May you be operative in our lives and may we just speak that continual yes to you, following after you in your footsteps to the glory of the Father. We prayed it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you again for being here as part of this uh, baptismal service. This is uh, one of the most exciting things that happens in the life of the church when believers come, making a testimony, a confession of their faith, and doing so publicly uh, to a watching crowd. You know, sometimes in New Testament days when they did this, it wasn't uh, to a warm, receptive crowd, but many times it was to those who were making fun of them for turning their back on their former life in, in Jewish custom or whatever, and the families were there deriding them and being critical of them. For the most part here, I think we're, a, we're an affirming congregation this morning. We're thrilled that these individuals are coming forth to make this public confession of Christ. In the Church of the Nazarene, this is not a saving act, um, at your baptism, but you've already come to a place of belief, and this is a testimony of what Christ has done in your life. It's an extension of his grace in your life that you're receiving in this moment, his empowerment in baptism. And so we come forward making a confession of faith. It is a clear testimony that we've decided to follow after Jesus Christ. Um, I'm giving you a little bit of a history lesson here, but I, I think it's important. Baptism should not mark, as it did for Jesus, it didn't mark a culminating point in his ministry, but it marked the beginning of his ministry. And really, that's what happens in these waters as well. This is not a finishing point. Baptism is not a finishing point. This is a launching point of what your life in Christ means going forward. And so when we hear John the Baptist saying things like this, he said, now, you know, to those who were gathering to be baptized, he made this statement, go forth from this place, keeping fruit, and, and uh, keeping, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, keeping... Um, Producing fruit in keeping with repentance. There, I'll get there finally. And so he told them exactly what that looked like. He said to the crowd, they, they said, what's that, look, what's that look like in our life? It says, and he said, well, it means if somebody's missing the cloak, if they don't have something, go and sell something or give them something to help them along the way. To the, to the tax collectors, they came to be baptized. And he, they said, well, what does it mean in our life? And he said to them, it means just collecting the tax that is due, not lining your pocket with other tax money. Uh, others came and said, well, what's it mean, what's it mean to us? What, it, it means not taking, the soldiers came and said, what's it mean to us? It means not overpowering people, not exerting your position, taking, taking, um, taking privileges from others and, and really enslaving them. So it meant living a consistent life in the call of Jesus Christ. From the waters of baptism, go forth, bless those around you, bless your community. And so we've got the privilege of sharing uh, in this this morning with some of, of those who are coming uh, to be baptized. And we're going to ask them to line up here at the, at the door. I think Cassie's going to help them uh, come back through. I think as they come, uh, Dana is going to be a part of this process as well. Uh, for I think we've got five children being baptized this morning. And so Dana will uh, ask the families to stand. And if you want to position yourself to get in a better place to take uh, pictures or that kind of thing... You can do that as well as uh, your candidate comes forward to be baptized. So I tell you what, you can bring the first two up here. Let's bring those two boys. Let's get started on the right foot. You stay out there, Hudson, for a second. You stay right there. You're going to be able to watch these. I want you guys to be able to see the others being baptized, okay? Daniel, you're going to be first, I think. Dana? Hey, Right 
everybody that's with him today? Okay. okay. Daniel's in fifth grade at Bridgeview Elementary. His uh, parents are Sergey and Lena, and this is what he says. My birth was a miracle to my parents, so from the first days of my life, they were telling me about God and his work in their lives. When I was growing up, it wasn't natural for me to ask God for anything. I prayed for God to give me a memory so I could learn poetry. I prayed for my brother when he was sick, and God always answered my prayers. Today, I made the decision to be baptized. I want to speak about my faith and promise God in front of the whole church that I accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and I will try to be and act like Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Daniel, I'll now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Simon is in third grade at Bridgeview Elementary. His parents are also, also Sergey and Elena. He says, I was born in a family where they love and know God. I love to realize that my God is great and all powerful. Since my childhood, I had questions about the reality of God because I had not seen him. I asked these questions and I always got the same answer. Pray and ask God to present himself to you. I prayed and continued to pray and ask him to be there for me. I believe that he is the real God, and by my baptism, I want to say about my faith before people and God that I accept his love and care for me, and I want to be like him and learn to love him more. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Simon, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Next is Caroline Davis. Everybody that's here with her today, I'd like for you guys to stand. They're up there already. Caroline is in fourth grade at um, Meadowview Elementary, and she is the um, daughter of Autumn and Tim Davis. And this is what she says. I made the decision to get baptized because my church offered to baptize me, and I wanted to know how it felt. To me, baptize means Baptism means getting a new life and turning to God. Baptism is like showing the world that you follow God. Being baptized is like showing an example of following Jesus. I have been a Christian as long as I can remember, but now I am showing the world that I follow God. Amen. Amen. Caroline, I now baptize you. In the name of the Father, and of Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. There you go. Good girl. Good job. Congratulations. Next is Cohen Seagraves. We'd like everybody that's with Cohen today to stand. Cohen is in third grade at Montrose Elementary. He is the um, son of Timmy and Christine Seagraves and the grandson of Mike and Kim Seagraves. And this is what he says. I learned about God's love and who Jesus is at church by studying quizzing and at church camp. I accepted Jesus into my heart at Camp Faith two years ago when I was seven. Pastor Dana and Lisa, along with Mama and Papa, have helped me learn what it looks like to be a Christian. Jesus has helped me more be more kind to family and others. God's love has taught me to help others. Amen. Cohen, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Last.
last but not least of the kids, we have Hudson King. We'd like everybody with him to stand. Hudson is in the first grade at Bible Center School, and his parents are Patrick and Ashley King. And he says, why do I want to be baptized? Because Jesus was baptized, so I want to. I also ask Jesus to live in my heart. Amen. Amen. I'm going to try to say nothing about him being a Notre Dame fan. It might have something to do with how long I hold him under the water. Hudson, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All right, Travis, we got we got one more to be baptized today. Travis Lane. We're gonna invite him to come down into the pool. And those who are here with Travis, if uh, you guys would stand at this time, he's coming. I promise. You okay? Yeah. say anything. I was just going to say that the, ba the baptism was my testimony. But I can't do that. <laughs> Everybody that knows me knows it's hard for me to keep my mouth shut. Mainly because one, I'm a West Virginia fan. <laughs> and for two, that's just how I am. Not a lot of you know, my family does. I was an addict for many, many years of my life growing up. Uh, I dislocated my knee back when I was a freshman in high school, and that's where it all started. I have been clean for going on 13 years now. Amen. Yeah. It's been a long road. It's been a hard road. But I know my Lord and Savior. Amen, yes. All that washed away. Yes. My grandmother, who I loved more than anything in this world, both of them are not here. I love them dearly. I miss them dearly. My family knows. Especially my mama, Pauline. She was a God-fearing, Jesus-loving woman. And when I was out there in the world, she has prayed many, many, many prayers for me. Yeah. Because I was raised in church. And of course, I went out into the world. The Bible says, if you lead it, if you bring them to church and get them to know no matter where they go, and I'm paraphrasing, no matter what happens in the world, they will always come back. And that's what's happened to me. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I wish my mama probably was here to see this. But I know she is. I know where she is. Yeah. And I know Amen. she's looking. Amen. Or at least that's what I want to believe. Sure. But I want to say to my family, especially my mom and dad, they came all the way from Madison to be here to watch this. Thank you. I love both of you all so much. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you, Lord. Yes. For saving me. Amen. Yes. And for my, my word to... My words of advice for each and every one of you, for the loved ones that are lost and don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. I'm a sports guy, okay? So I'm going to quote Jimmy Valvano. 
Don't give up. Yeah, true. Don't ever give up. Yeah, it's true. Amen. Because eventually, eventually, those prayers will be answered. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Travis. I now baptize you, Travis, in the name of the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Great, awesome testimonies. Thanks to the kids and thanks uh, to Travis for sharing. And you know, the picture of uh, the baptism is we're dead in our transgressions and sins and then we're raised to newness of life in Jesus Christ. I pray that if you've not made that personal decision for yourself that you will and that you'll join us in these baptismal waters that you'll have a new life in him. May God go with you today. Be a blessing to someone else this week. God go with you. Hey there, I am Pastor Cassie. I'm the youth pastor here at South Charleston First Church in the Nazarene. Thank you so much for joining us online. We'd love to see you here in person at one of our services. We have one at 9 a.m. and one at 11 a.m. with life groups happening in between at 10 a.m. We also have Kidman available at 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. We'd love to see you here.